This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. So, welcome back. And what I want to do today is um, continue our discussion of the EM algorithm. Um, and in particular, I want to talk about the EM formulation that we derived in the previous lecture and apply it to um, the mixture of Gaussian's model, um, apply it to a different model called the mixture of naive Bayes' model. And then a large, part of a large part of today's lecture will be on the factor analysis algorithm, which will also use EM. And as part of that, we'll actually take a brief digression to talk a little bit about sort of useful properties of Gaussian distributions. Um, so just to recap where we are, in the previous lecture, I started to talk about unsupervised learning, which was um, <coughs> machine learning problems where you're given an unlabeled training set comprising m examples, say. Right? And, and so the fact that there are no labels, um, that's what makes this unsupervised learning. And so, you know, one problem that I talked about last time was um, what if you're given a data set that looks like this and you want to model the density P of X from which you think the data had, uh, had, had been drawn. And so with a data set like this, maybe you think it's a mixture of two Gaussians and um, start to talk about an algorithm for fitting a mixture of Gaussians model, right? And so concretely, um, we said that we would model the density of X, P of X, as sum over Z, P of X given Z <coughs> times P of Z, where this latent random variable, meaning this hidden random variable Z, indicates which of the two Gaussian distributions each of your data points came from. Um, and so we had, you know, Z was multinomial with parameter phi, say, and X conditioned on it coming from the Jf Gaussian was um, given by that by by uh, a Gaussian with mean mu j and covariance sigma j. Right. So um, I guess at the beginning of the previous lecture, I actually talked about a very specific algorithm that I you know sort of pulled out of the air for fitting the parameters of this model for fitting the parameters phi, mu, and sigma. Um, but then in the second half of the previous lecture, I talked about what's called the EM algorithm, in which um, our goal is maximum likelihood estimation of the parameters. So we want to maximize in terms of theta, you know, the sort of usual, right, maximum log likelihood. Well, try to theta. And um, because we have um, a latent random variable z, this is really maximizing in terms of theta, sum over i, sum over z, p of x i, z i, <coughs> parameterized by theta, okay? Um, so using Jensen's inequality last time, we worked out the EM algorithm in which in the E step, we would choose these probability distributions, qi, to be our posterior you know, on z given x and parameterized by theta. And in the m step, we would um, set theta to be the value that um, maximizes this. So these, these were all formulas that we worked out last time. Um, and the cartoons that I drew was that you have this log likelihood function, L of theta, that's often hard to maximize. And what the E step does is choose these probability distribution QIs. And in the cartoon I drew, what that corresponded to <coughs> was finding a lower bound 
um, for the log likelihood, and then horizontal axis is stator, and then the m step you maximize the lower bound, right? So maybe you were here previously, until so you jump to the new point, the the, the new um, maximum of this lower bound. Okay, and so this 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 little curve here, right? This lower bound function here, that's really you know the right hand side of that arg max. Okay, so this thing, this whole thing in 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 the arg max, if you view this thing as a function of theta, this function of theta is a lower bound for the log likelihood of theta, and so in the m step we maximize this lower bound, and that corresponds to you know jumping to this new maximum, to this new maximum of the lower bound. Um, <clears throat> so it turns out that in the EM algorithm, so why, why do we bother with the EM algorithm, right? It turns out that very often, um, and this will be true for all the examples we see today, it turns out that very often, um, if, it turns out that very often in um, the EM algorithm, maximizing the m step so performing the maximization in the m step will be tractable and can often be done analytically in a closed form whereas um, if you were trying to maximize this objective we try to you know take this formula on the right this maximum likely objective was to take this one on the right and set this derivative to zero and try to solve you find that you're unable to obtain a solution to this in closed form this this maximization okay and so a concrete example of that is that um, you remember our discussion on exponential family models, right? It turns out that if x and z, you know, this is jointly, I guess, line in exponential family, so if p of x comma z parameterized by theta, if this is an exponential family distribution, which it turns out to be true for the mixture of Gaussian's distribution, then it turns out that the m step here will be tractable, um, and the e step will also be tractable, and so you can do each of these steps very easily. Whereas um, performing, you're trying to perform this original maximum likelihood estimation problem, um, this one right, would be computationally very difficult. If you were to set the derivatives to zero and try to solve for that analytically, you won't be able to find an analytic solution to this. Okay. Um, so what I want to do in a second is actually take this view of the EM algorithm and um, and apply it <coughs> to the mixture of Gaussian's models. I'm going to take these E steps and M steps and work them out for the mixture of Gaussian's model. Um, but before I do that, I just want to say one more thing about, about this broader view of the EM algorithm. It turns out that there's one other way of thinking about the EM algorithm, um, which is the following. I can define um, an optimization objective, J of theta comma Q, I'll define it to be this. Um, it's, this is just a thing in the argmax in the m step. Okay. Um, <coughs> and so what we proved using Jensen's inequality is that. Um, the log likelihood of theta is greater than or equal to j of theta comma q. So in other words, we, we proved last time that for any value of theta and q, the log likelihood upper bounds j of theta and q. And so um, just to relate this back to sort of yet more things that you already know, um, you can also think of, I hope you're on coordinate ascent. Right, hope you're on our discussion a while back on the coordinate ascent optimization algorithm. So what you can show, um, and I won't actually show this, but you can sort of just take a word for it and think for it at home if you want, um, that EM is just coordinate ascent on the function J. So in the E step, you maximize um, you know, with respect to Q, and in the M step, you maximize with respect to theta. So this is sort of another view of the EM algorithm um, that shows that that shows why it has to converge. For example, at least in the sense of J of theta comma Q having to monotonically increase on every iteration. Okay. So, um, right. 
So what I want to do next is actually take, <coughs> take this general EM machinery that we worked out and apply it to the mixture of Gaussian's model. Uh, before I do that, let me just check if there are questions about you know, the, the, the EM algorithm as a whole. So let's go ahead and work out the mixture of Gaussian's EM. Um, right. Right. MOG, that's my abbreviation for mixture of Gaussians. Um, so in the E step, we have to work out those Q distributions. Right? In particular, we have to work out, so Q is the probability distribution over the latent random variable Z. And so in the E step, we're going to figure out what is, you know, I need to compute what is Q of ZI equals J. You, you can think of this as my writing, you know, P of ZI equals J, right, under the Q distribution. That's what this notation means. Um, and so the EM algorithm tells us that, um, <clears throat> let's see, Q of J is the posterior probability of Z being the value J. Um, and given, given xi and, and, and all your parameters. And so, um, well, the way you compute this is via Bayes' rule, right? So that is going to be equal to p of xi given zi equals j times p of zi j divided by Right, that's sort of <clears throat> by Bayes' rule. Um, and so this, you know, because um, xi given zi equals j, you know, this was a Gaussian with mean mu j and covariance sigma j. And so to compute this first term, you plug in the formula for, a dense, for, for, for the Gaussian density there with parameters mu j and sigma j. And this, you know, because um, you know Z was was multinomial, right? Were parameters given by phi, and so the probability of Z I being only J is just phi J, and so you can substitute these terms in. And similarly, do the same thing for the denominator, and that's how you work out what Q is. Okay, and so. <clears throat> In the previous lecture, this value, the probability that zi equals j under the q distribution, that was what I, I denoted that as wij. So that would be the e step. Um, <coughs> and then in the m step, we maximize with respect to all of our parameters um, this. Well, I seem to be writing the same formula down a lot today. <coughs> right? And so, um, just to be com completely concrete about how you do that, right? So if you do that, you end up with, um, so plugging in you know, the, the, the quantities that you know, um, that becomes this. Let's see. And so <clears throat> this is completely concrete about what the m-step is doing. Um, so in the m-step, you know, that was, I guess, qi of z i being only j. This, this inner summation, sum over j, is the sum over all the possible values of z i. Um, and then this thing here is my Gaussian density. You know, so I guess this thing, well, 
this first term here, right, is my p of xi given zi, and that's p of zi. Okay. And so, <clears throat> um, to maximize this with respect to, so you want to maximize this with respect to all of your parameters, phi, mu, and sigma. So to maximize with respect to the parameter mu, say, you would take the derivative with respect to mu and set that to zero. And, um, you would, and if you actually do that computation, you would get, for instance, that Um, <clears throat> that becomes your update to, to mu j. Okay, just so I, I want to. The equations aren't, aren't important. Uh, you, all, all of these equations are written down in the lecture notes. I'm writing these down just to be sort of con completely concrete about what the m step means. So write down that formula, plug in the densities you know, take derivatives set to zero, solve for mu j. And in the same way, you set derivatives equal to zero and solve for your updates for your other parameters, um, phi and sigma as well. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, let me just point out just one little tricky bit for this that, that you hadn't seen before, that, that I'll, mo most of you probably already know, but I just mentioned, is that um, um, since phi here is a multinomial distribution, when you take this formula and you maximize it with respect to phi, you actually have an additional constraint, right? That the sum over i, um, Excuse me. Sum over j, phi j must be equal to one. All right. So, again, in the M set, want to take this thing and maximize it with respect to all the parameters. And when you maximize this with respect to the parameters phi j, you need to respect the constraint that sum over j phi j must be equal to one. And so, um, well, you already know how to do constraint maximization. Right? We talked about the method of Lagrange multipliers and the generalized Lagrange when we talked about support vector machines. And so, to actually perform the maximization in terms of phi j, you you know construct the Lagrangian, which is um, right. So that's the well, that's the equation from above. And we're going to know the dot 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 plus beta times um, that, where this is the Lagrange multiplier. And this is, you know, this is your optimization objective. <laughs> and so to actually solve the parameters phi j, you would set the parameters of this, <clears throat> of the Lagrangian to zero and solve, okay? And then if you, if you, if you, if, if you didn't work for the math, you get, you know, the appropriate value to update the phi j's to. Um, which I won't do, but all the, all, all the full derivations are written on the lecture notes, so I won't do that here. Okay, and so, um, oh, and, and so if you actually perform all these computations, you can also verify that, um, I sort of just wrote down a bunch of formulas for the EM algorithm um, at the beginning of the last lecture. I said, you know, for the mixture of Gaussian's model, I said for the EM, here's the formula for computing the WIJs, and here's the formula for computing the mu's and so on. And this derivation is where all of those formulas actually come from. Okay. Um, questions about this? Yeah. Oh. I see. Yeah. So um, it turns out that yes, there's also a constraint that the phi j's must be must be greater than zero. Um, it turns out that. Um, if you want, you could actually write down the generalized Lagrangian, you know, incorporating all of these constraints as well, and you could solve, solve taking into account these constraints. It turns out that in this particular derivation, actually it turns out that very often when you find maximum likelihood estimate for multinomial distribution probabilities, it turns out that if you ignore this constraint and you just maximize the formula, you actually, you know, luckily you end up with values that actually are greater than or equal to zero. And so if even ignoring this constraint, you end up with parameters that are greater than or equal to zero, that shows that that must be the correct solution because adding that constraint won't change anything. So, so yeah, so this constraint sort of is important, but it turns out if you ignore this and, and just do, do what I wrote down, you actually get the right answer. Cool. Okay. <coughs> um, great. So 
let me just quickly, very quickly talk about one more example of a mixture model. Um, and the most example for this is, um, imagine you want to do text clustering. Right? So someone gives you a large set of documents and you want to cluster them together into cohesive topics. Um, I think I mentioned the, 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 the news website, news.google.com. That's one, one application of text clustering where you might want to look at you know, all, the, all, of, all the news stories about today, um, all the news stories um, written by everyone, written by all the online news websites about whatever happened yesterday. Um, and there'll be many, many different stories on the same thing, right? And um, by running an algorithm, like a text clustering algorithm, you can group related documents together, okay? So <clears throat> how do you apply the EM algorithm to text clustering? Um, well, Um, and I want to do this to illustrate <clears throat> an example in which um, you run an EM algorithm on discrete valued inputs, where, where, the, where, the, input, where the training examples XI are discrete valued. Um, so what I want to talk about specifically is the mixture of naive Bayes model um, and uh, depending on how much you remember about naive Bayes, um, I talked about two event models. One was the multivariate Bernoulli event model. One was the multinomial event model. Um, today I'm going to use the multivariate Bernoulli event model. If you don't remember what those terms mean any anymore, don't worry about it. The, the, I think the equations will still make sense. But <clears throat> um, in this setting, we're given a training set. Say, x1 through xm. So we're given, say, m text documents where each xi is, um, you know, is 0, 1 to the n. So each, each of our training examples is an <coughs> n-dimensional bit to vector, right? So this is the representation where xi um, j was, you know, it indicates whether where j appears um, in document i. So, um, <clears throat> and let's say that we're going to model zi, the, our, our latent random variable, meaning our hidden random variable zi will take on two values, zero or one. So um, this means I'm just going to find two clusters. You can, you can generalize this to k clusters if you want. Okay. So, um, in the mixture of naive Bayes model, we assume that zi is distributed Bernoulli with some value phi, so there's some probability of each document coming from, you know, cluster 1 or from cluster 2. And we assume that um, the probability of xi given zi, right, um, <coughs> We'll make the same naive base assumption as we did before. Okay. Um, and more specifically, And so most specifically, probability of xi equals 1 given zi equals, say, 0 will be given by um, a parameter phi subscript j given z equals 0. And so <clears throat> if you take this chalkboard and if you take all instances of the alphabet z and replace it with y, then you end up with exactly the same equations as that written down for naive base like a long time ago. Okay. Um, <coughs> and um, I'm not actually going to work out the mechanics of deriving the EM algorithm, but it turns out that if you take this joint distribution over x and z, and um, if you work out what the equations are for the EM algorithm for, for, for maximum likelihood estimation of parameters, you find that 
in the E step, um, you compute, you know, let's say these parameters, these weights, wi, which are going to be equal to, say, a perceiver distribution of z being equal to 1, conditioned on xi, parameterized by, you know, your phi's, and, and, and given your parameters. Um, <coughs> and in the m step, And those are the equations you get in the m step. Um, <clears throat> and again, the equations themselves aren't too important. Just, just sort of convey. Well, I'll give you a minute. I'll give you a second to finish writing, I guess. And do, the and those are the finished writing. Take a look at take a look at these equations and see if they make intuitive sense to you. Why these three equations sort of sound like they might be right thing to do. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> Oh, say that again? Why oh, yes, thank you. Right. Z. Sorry, just everywhere I wrote Y, I actually meant Z. So, um, what is it? Uh, <clears throat> normally, you initialize phi to be something else, say randomly. Um, yeah. So, just like in, in 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 naive phase, we saw zero probabilities is a bad thing. So, for the same reason, you try to avoid zero probabilities. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> just the intuition behind these exp these these equations is, um, you know, in the E step, W i is, is you're going to take your best guess for whether the document came from cluster one or cluster zero, right? This is this is this is very similar to the intuitions behind the E M algorithm that we talked about in the previous lecture. So, in, in the E step, we're going to you know compute these weights that tell us do I think this document came from cluster one or cluster zero. Um, and then in the m step, I'm going to say, you know, this, the, this, this numerator is a sum over all, all the elements of my training set of sort of informally, right? Wi is 1 if I think the document came from cluster 1, say. And so this will be essentially sum up all the times I saw word j um, <clears throat> in documents that I think are in cluster 1. And these are sort of weighted by the actual probability I think it came from cluster 1. And then I'll divide by, you know, again, if all of these were ones and zeros, then I'd be dividing by the actual number of documents I had in cluster one. So if, if, if all the WIs were either one and zeros, then those would be exactly the fraction of documents that I saw in cluster one, in which I also saw word J. Okay? But in the M algorithm, you don't make a hard assignment decision about is this in cluster one or is this in cluster zero. You instead represent your uncertainty about cluster membership what the parameters wi. Okay. Um, it actually turns out that when you when we actually implement this particular model, it actually turns out that by the nature of this computation, all the values of WIs will be will be very close to either one or zero. So it'll be numerically almost indistinguishable from, from, from ones and zeros. This is a property of naive base. If you actually compute this probability for almost all the documents, you find that WI is either you know 0.0001 or 0.9999. It would be amazingly close to either 0 or 1. 
And so the M set, so, so this is pretty much guessing whether each document is in cluster one or cluster zero, and then, and then sort of using formulas that are very similar to maximum likelihood estimation for naive phase. Okay. Um, cool. Are there, and if, and if, if some of these equations don't look that familiar to you anymore, so sort of go back and take another look at you know, what you saw in naive phase, which, uh, and, and hopefully you can see the links there as well. Um, questions about this before I move on? Okay. <clears throat> um, oh, and of course, the way I got these equations was by turning through the machinery of the EM algorithm, right? I didn't, just, I didn't just write these out of thin air. The way you do this is by writing down the E step and the M step for this model, and then the M step, you know, saying derivatives equals to zero and solving for that. So that's how you get the M step and the E step. So, <coughs> um, So the last thing I want to do today is talk about um, the factor analysis model. And um, <clears throat> the reason I want to do this is, is so there's sort of two reasons, I guess. One is, you know, factor, ana factor analysis is kind of a useful model. It's, 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 not, it's not as widely used as mixtures of Gaussians and mixtures of naive phase, maybe. Um, but it's sort of, sort of useful. Um, but the other reason I want to derive this model is that um, there are a few steps in the math that are more generally useful. In particular, when I describe factor analysis, this will be an example in which um, we'll do EM, where the latent random variable, where the hidden random variable Z is going to be continuous valued. And so some of the math we'll see in deriving factor analysis will be a little bit different than what you saw before. And, and they're just a, it turns out the, the, the full derivation for EM for factor analysis is sort of extremely long and complicated. Um, I, won't, I sort of won't inflict that on you in lecture today, but I will still be writing more equations than, you know, than you'll see me do in other lectures because there are sort of just a few steps in the factor analysis derivation that are sort of particularly illustrative. Um, <clears throat> so to actually motivate the model, um, I just want to contrast this to the mixture of Gaussians model, right? So for, for the mixture of Gaussians model, which is our first model, um, we had that, um, you know, I would, well, I, I actually motivated it by drawing a data set like this, right? That what if you have a data set that looks like this? Right, so this was a problem where um, n is two-dimensional and you have, I don't know, maybe 50 or 100 training examples, whatever. And I said, um, maybe we want to, given an unlabeled training set like this, maybe you want to model this as a mixture of two Gaussians. Okay. And so mixture of Gaussian models tend to be um, applicable where M is larger um, and often much larger than N, where, where, where the number of training examples you have is, you know, is at least as large as, and, and usually is usually much larger than the dimension of the data. Um, what I want to do is talk about a different problem where I want you to imagine what happens if <coughs> either the dimension of your data is, about equal, is, is roughly equal to the number of examples you have, um, or maybe <coughs> the dimension of your data is maybe even much larger than the number of training examples you have. Okay? So how do you model such so very high dimensional data, which, which, you, which, you, which, you will, which you will see sometimes, right? If you run a plant or something, you run a factory, maybe you have um, a thousand measurements all through your plant, but you only have, five, but you only have you know, 20 days of data. So you can have thousand dimensional data, but 20 examples of it only. So given data that has this property, um, and again, you're given you know, a training set of M examples, well, what can you do to try to model the density of x? Um, 
So one thing you could do is try to model it just as a single Gaussian, right? So never mind mixtures of Gaussians. Let's just say you try to model it as a single Gaussian. You can say x is distributed with mean mu and parameter sigma, um, where sigma is going to be known in n by n matrix. And so if you work out the maximum likelihood estimate of the parameters, you know, you find that the maximum likelihood estimate for the mean is just the empirical mean of your training set. Right, so that makes sense. <coughs> um, and the maximum likelihood estimate of the covariance matrix sigma will be this. Um, <coughs> right? Um, but it turns out that in this regime, where the data is much higher dimensional, excuse me, where the data's dimension is much larger than the number of training examples you have, um, if you compute the maximum likelihood estimate of the covariance matrix sigma, you find that this matrix is singular. Okay. Um, by, which, and by singular, I mean that it doesn't have full rank, or it has zero eigenvalues, so it doesn't have, I hope, I hope at least one of those terms makes sense. Um, so, <coughs> All right, and I guess another way of saying it is that the matrix sigma will be non-invertible. Um, and just in pictures, now one concrete example is if um, D is if n equals m equals two. If you have two-dimensional data, um, and you have two two examples, so if you have two training examples in two dimensions. So this is um, x one. Next two, this is my unlabeled data. If you fit the Gaussian to this data set, you find that, um, you know, well, you remember I used to draw contours of Gaussians as ellipses, right? So, this is, you know, so these are examples of different contours of Gaussians. You find that the maximum likelihood estimate Gaussian for this corresponds to, you know, a Gaussian where the contours are sort of infinitely thin and infinitely long in that direction. Okay, so, in, in sort of, so, so the contours will sort of be infinitely thin, right, and stretch infinitely long in that direction. Um, and, and, and another way of saying this is that um, <clears throat> if you actually plug in the formula for the density of a Gaussian, um, you know, which is this, um, you won't actually get a nice answer because the matrix sigma is non-invertible, so sigma inverse is not defined, and this is zero. So you also have so one over zero times e to the some inverse of a non-invertible matrix. So 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 so, so this is sort of not a good model. Um, so let's see if we can do better, right? So given this sort of data, how do you model p of x? Well. Well, one thing you could do is constrain sigma to be diagonal. Um, right, so you have a covariance matrix, x is. Okay, so in other words, you're going to constrain sigma to be this matrix. Right, with um, zeros on the off diagonals. I hope this makes sense. The, these zeros I've written down here denote that you know everything off the diagonal of this matrix is a zero. Um, <clears throat> so the maximum likelihood estimate of the parameters will be pretty much what you'd expect, right? And um, in pictures, what this means is that you're modeling the distribution via Gaussians whose contours are axis aligned. So that's one example of a Gaussian where the covariance is, where, where the covariance is diagonal. Um, and you know, here's another example. Right? 
And so if here's the third example. But all three of these are examples of Gaussians where the covariance matrix is off diagonal. Okay? Um, and I don't know, you could do this in model P of X, but this isn't very nice because you've now thrown away all the correlations um, between the different variables. So, so the axes here are like x1 and x2, right? So you've thrown away, you're, you're, you're failing to capture any of the correlations or the relationships between um, any pair of variables in your data. Yeah? yeah so can you say again, what, is, what does it do if it's all diagonal? Oh, say that again? If the covariance matrix is diagonal, what does that do again? I didn't quite understand what the examples mean. Oh, okay. okay. Um, so these are the contours of the Gaussian density that I'm drawing, right? So, um, so let's see. <clears throat> Suppose the covariance matrix is diagonal, then you know you can ask what is p of x, you know, parameterized by mu and sigma, right? If 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 sigma is diagonal, and so this would be some Gaussian bump, right? So remember in in oh boy, the draw is really bad here, but in two D, you know, the density for Gaussian is like this bump-shaped thing. Right, so this is the, the density of a Gaussian. Wow, this is a really bad drawing. Yeah, where those are axes x1 and x2, and the height of this is, is p of x. And so those figures over there are the contours of the density of a Gaussian. So th those are the contours of this 3D shape. So I know these are contours. What's special about these contours? What makes them different than uh, sort of a general? Oh, I see. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, they're, they're, they're axis aligned. So the... Um, you know, the main, these, uh, let's see, so I'm not drawing a contour like this, right, because the uh, main axes of this um, are not aligned with the x1 and x2 axes. So this will correspond to a Gaussian where, where the off diagonals are non zero. Right. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's see. You could do this. This is all the work. It turns out that with as few as two training examples, um, you can learn a non-singular covariance matrix. But but this is sort of, but you've thrown away all the correlation in the data. So so this is not a great model. Um, it turns out. It turns out you can you can do something. Uh, actually, we'll come back and use this property later. Um, but it turns out you can do something even more restrictive, which is um, you can constrain sigma to be equal to sigma squared times the identity matrix. So in other words, you can constrain it to be diagonal matrix. Um, and moreover, all the diagonal entries must be the same. And so the, for the cartoon for that is that um, you're constraining the contours of your Gaussian density to be circular. Okay? And this would be sort of an even harsher constraint to place on your model. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me, either of these versions, diagonal sigma or sigma being the sort of constant value diagonal, are maybe overly strong assumptions. Right? So if, if, if you have enough data, maybe you'd like to model just a little bit of a correlation between your different variables. Um, so the factor analysis algorithm, excuse me, the factor analysis model is one way to attempt to do that. So here's the idea. So this is how the factor analysis model um, models your data. We're going to assume that there is a latent random variable. Okay, it just means hidden random variable z. So z is distributed Gaussian with mean 0 and um, covariance identity, where z will be a d-dimensional vector now. And um, d will be will be chosen so that it is lower than the dimension of, of, of your x's. Okay? Um, and now I'm going to assume that x is given by, um, well, let me write like this. Each xi is distributed, actually, sorry, I'm just, um, We need to assume that conditions on the value of z, x is given by another Gaussian 
with mean given by mu plus um, lambda z and covariance given by the matrix psi. Um, <clears throat> so just to say this in a, just to say the second line in an equivalent form, um, equivalently, I'm going to model x as mu plus lambda z plus you know a noise term epsilon where epsilon is Gaussian with mean zero and covariance psi. Um, and so the parameters of this model are going to be um, a vector mu, which is n-dimensional, a matrix um, lambda, which is n by d, and a covariance matrix psi, which is n by n. And I'm going to impose an additional constraint on psi. I'm going to impose a constraint that psi <coughs> is diagonal. Okay. Um, so that was the formal definition. Let me let me actually sort of give a couple of examples to to to, to make this more concrete. Um, So um, let's give one concrete example. Suppose z is you know one dimensional and x is two dimensional. Um, so let's 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 see what um, this model. Let's see a sort of a specific instance of the factor analysis model and how we're modeling the joint you know the distribution over x. So what what this gives us um, in terms of a model for p of x. Right. So. Um, Let's see, for this model too, let me assume that um, lambda is 2, 1, and psi, which has to be a diagonal matrix, remember, is this. Okay? So um, z is one dimensional, so let me just draw a typical sample for z, right? So, you know, if I. Okay, so if I draw. Zi from a Gaussian, so that's a typical sample for what Z might look like. And so um, I'm going to enumerate. I'm, I'm, I'm going to call this Z1, Z2, Z3, and so on. If if if, if this really were a typical sample, the order of the Z's would be jumbled up. But, but I'm just ordering them like this, um, just to make the just to make the example easier. Okay, so here's a typical sample of random variable Z from a Gaussian distribution with mean zero and covariance one. Um, so, oh, and for this example, let me just set mu equals zero. It's two by the, <coughs> just so it's easier to talk about. So, um, lambda times z, right, we'll take each of these numbers and multiply them by lambda, and so you find that all the values for lambda times z will lie on a straight line, right? So for example, um, this point here would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, I guess. So if this was z7, then this point here would be lambda times z7. And now that's the number in R2, because lambda is a 2 by 1 matrix. And so <clears throat> you know, what I've drawn here is like a typical sample for lambda times z. And um, the final step for this is, you know, what's the typical sample for x looks like? Well, x is mu plus lambda z plus epsilon, where epsilon is Gaussian with mean mu and covariance given by psi. Right? And so the last step, you know, to draw a typical sample for the random variables x, um, I'm going to take these lambda z's, these are really same as mu plus lambda z because mu is zero in this example. And um, around this point, I'm going to place 
an axis aligned ellipse, or in other words, I'm going to create a Gaussian distribution centered on this point. Um, and this ellipse I've drawn <coughs> corresponds to one of the contours of my uh, density for epsilon. Right? And so if you imagine placing a little Gaussian bump here. And so I'll draw, 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 uh, draw an example from this little Gaussian. And let's say I get that point. Right? I'll do the same here. so on. So I draw a bunch of examples from these Gaussians and um, the, what I call it, the orange points I drew um, will comprise the typical sample for what the distribution of x is under this model. Okay? Yeah. Oh, uh, say that again? Oh yes, you do. And and in this example, I set mu to go zero zero, just to make it easier. If mu was something else, you take the whole picture and you sort of shift it, you know, to to whatever the value of mu is. Yeah. So there's a horizontal line right there with the z. What do, do the x's course? What the, what does that line axis correspond to? Oh, um, so this is z is one dimensional. So um, here I'm plotting a typical sample for z. So this is this is like zero. So this is just the z-axis, right? So z is one-dimensional data. So this line here is, a, is, is like a plot of, you know, a typical sample of, of z values for z. Okay, yeah? So you actually need a point by x, right? And the actual data in the k examples. Uh, yes, right. So you projecting them into that. Um, uh, let's not talk about projections yet, but yeah, right. So right, so right. So these, these beige points, you know, so that's like x1, and you know that's like x two and so on, right? So the beige points are what I see, and um, so so I'm sort of in reality, right, all you ever get to see are the x's. But um, just like in the mixture of Gaussians model, I told a story about well, we we'll imagine the Gal you know, the data came from two Gaussians and it was this hidden random variable z that led to the generation of the x's from two Gaussians. So in the same way, I'm sort of telling the story here, in which all the algorithm actually sees are the are the orange points, but we're gonna you know, tell a story about how the data came about, and that, and that story is what comprises the factor analysis model. Okay? Um, so one, way, one, one other way to see the intuition in this model is that we're going to think of the model, uh, think of the, one, one way, just informally, uh, not formally, but one way to think about this model is you can think of this factor analysis model as modeling the data from coming from, you know, lower dimensional subspace, more or less, um, so the data x here lies approximately on you know, one D line, and then plus a little bit of noise, plus a little bit of you know, random noise, so the x isn't exactly on this one D line. That's, that's one informal way of thinking about factor analysis. Um, <coughs> so, trap. not doing great on time. Um, well, let's do this. So let me just do one more quick example, which is um, in this example, let's say z is in R2 and x is in R3, right? And so um, in this example, z, you know, your data z now lies in 2D. And so um, I'm going to draw this on a sheet of paper. So um, let's say the axes of my paper are the z1 and z2 axes. And so, you know, here's a typical sample of point z, right? And so um, we'll then take the sample z. Well, actually, let me just draw this here as well. Right, so this is a typical sample for z drawn on the z1 and z2 axes. And I guess the origin would be here, rather, whatever. So center around zero. And then we'll take this and map it to mu plus lambda z. And what that means is, you have imagined that the 3D space of this classroom is R3. What that means is to we'll take this typical sample of z's and we'll map it to position in free space. So we'll take the sheet of paper and move it somewhere at some orientation in 3D space. 
And the last step is um, you have x equals mu plus lambda z plus epsilon. And so you would take the set of points, which are lying in some plane you know, in our 3D space, you add a little bit of noise to these. And, 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 the, and the noise will sort of come from Gaussians that are axis aligned. Okay, so, so, so you end up with a data set that's sort of, you know, like a little, like a fat pancake with a little bit of fuzz on your pancake, right? Lying a little bit off your pancake. Um, so that's the model. Let's actually talk about how to fit the parameters of the model. Okay. Um, <coughs> in order to describe how to fit the model, um, I'm just going to need to rewrite Gaussians in just a very slightly different way. Um, so in particular, let's say I have a vector x. I'm going to use this notation to denote partitioned vectors, right? x1, x2, um, where if x1 is, say, an r-dimensional vector, and x2 is, say, an s-dimensional vector, and x is an r plus s-dimensional vector. Okay, so I'm going to use this notation to denote just you know, like taking a vector and sort of partitioning the vector into two halves. The first r elements followed by the last s elements. Um, so, let's say you have x coming from a Gaussian distribution with mean mu and covariance sigma, where <coughs> um, mu is itself a partition vector. So then break mu up into two pieces, mu1 and mu2. And the covariance matrix sigma is now a partitioned matrix. Okay, so what this means is to take the covariance matrix sigma and I'm going to break it up into four blocks, right? And so um, the dimensions of this is, you know, there'll be R elements here and there'll be S elements here the S elements here, now the R elements here. So for example, sigma 1, 2 will be an R by S matrix. Right, so it's R elements tall and S elements wide. Um, So this Gaussian that I've written down is really a joint distribution over lots of variables, right? So x is a vector, so you know, this specifies a joint distribution over x1 through x, you know, of, over xn, or over x of r plus s. Um, we can then ask, what are the marginal and conditional distributions of this Gaussian? So for example, with, with my Gaussian, I know what p of x is, um, but can I compute the marginal distribution of x1? Right, and so the p of x1 is just equal to, of course, integrate out x2, p of x1, comma x2, dx2. And if you actually perform that distribution, that computation, you find that you know, p of x1, um, I guess, is Gaussian with mean given by mu1 and sigma1, 1, 1. Right, so this is sort of no, no surprise. The marginal of a Gauss, the marginal distribution of a Gaussian, is itself a Gaussian. And you just take out the relevant subblocks of the covariance matrix and the relevant you know sub vector of the um, mu vector mean vector mu. Um, you can also compute conditionals. You can ask, what is p of x one given um, a specific value for x two, right? And so the way you compute that is, well, the usual way, p of x1, comma x2, divided by p of x2, right? And so um, you know what both of these formulas are, right? The numerator, well, this is just your usual Gaussian. You know, the, your joint distribution over x1, x2 is a Gaussian with mean mu and covariance sigma, and this, you know, by that marginalization operation I talked about is that. Um, so if you actually plug in the formulas for these two Gaussians, and if you simplify, 
The simplification step is actually fairly non-trivial. Um, if you haven't seen it before, this would actually be, you, you can try to do it. This would actually be somewhat difficult to do. Um, but if you, <coughs> if you plug in these two formulas for a Gaussian and, you know, and, and, and simplify that expression, you find that conditioned on the value of x2, x1 is, um, the distribution of x1 conditioned on x2 is itself going to be Gaussian. Um, and it will have mean mu of one given two and covariance sigma of one given two, where, um, well, so if after the simplification and the derivation that I'm not going to show, the formula for mu given of mu of one given two is given by this. And, um, Okay, and sigma of one given two is given by that. Okay, so these are just <clears throat> um, useful formulas to know for how to find the conditional distributions of a Gaussian and the marginal distributions of a Gaussian. And I, I won't actually show the derivation for this. So, hmm. Uh, sure. So this one on the left, mu of 1 given 2 equals mu 1 plus sigma 1, 2, sigma 2, 2 inverse times x2 minus mu 2. And this is sigma 1 given 2 equals sigma 1, 1 minus sigma 1, 2, sigma 2, 2 inverse sigma 2, 1. Okay. These are, all, these are all, all also on the lecture notes. Um, Not doing as well as I was hoping to on time. Um, well, actually, I think it's. Okay. <coughs> so it turns out, um, I think I'll skip this in the interest of time. So it turns out that, um, well, so let's go back and use these in the factor analysis model, right? It turns out that um, you can go back and, um, huh, do I want to do this? Yeah, I kind of need this, so. Well, fine. So let's go back and figure out, um, just what the joint distribution factor analysis uh, assumes on z and x is. Okay, so um, <coughs> under the factor analysis model, z and x, the random variable z and x, have some joint distribution given by. Um, I'll write this vector as mu z x and some covariance matrix sigma. Um, so let's go back and figure out what mu zx is and what sigma is. And, and I'll do this so that we'll get a little bit more practice with partition vectors and partition matrices. Um, so just to remind you, right, we have that z is Gaussian with mean zero and covariance identity, and x is you know, mu plus lambda z plus epsilon, where epsilon is Gaussian with mean zero covariance i. Okay, I had d just, I'm just writing down the same equations again. So let's, figure out, let's first figure out what this vector mu zx is. Um, well, the expected value of z is 0. And, and again, you know, as, as, as usual, I'll often drop the square brackets around here. Um, and the expected value of x is, well, it's the expected value of mu plus lambda z plus epsilon. Um, so you know, these two terms have 0 expectation. And so the expected value of x is just mu. Um, <clears throat> and so that vector mu zx, right, in my parameter for the Gaussian, um, this is going to be 
know, the expected value of this partition vector given by this partition z and x. And so that would just be 0 followed by mu. Okay, And so that's a d-dimensional 0 followed by an n-dimensional mu. Um, that's not going to work out what the covariance matrix sigma is. Um, so, <coughs> um, so the covariance matrix sigma, you know, if you work out definition of a partition. So this is into your partition matrix. Okay, will be so the covariance matrix sigma will comprise four blocks like that. Um, and so the upper leftmost block, which I write as sigma one one. Well, that, that uppermost left block is just <coughs> the covariance matrix of Z, which we know is the identity. Um, I'm just going to show you briefly how to derive some of the other blocks, right? So sigma 1, 2, that's the uh, upper, oh, actually, um, excuse me, sigma 2, 1, which is the lower left block, that's E of x minus Ex times Z minus Ez. So x is equal to mu plus lambda Z plus epsilon. Um, and then minus Ex is minus mu. And then times Z, um, <laughs> because the expected value of Z is 0. Right, so that's equal to zero. And so <clears throat> if you simplify, or if you expand this out, plus mu, minus mu cancel out. And so you have the expected value of lambda, oh, excuse me, right. ZZ transpose minus the expected value of epsilon Z um, so you go to that, um, which is just equal to lambda times the identity matrix. Okay? Does that make sense? Um, <clears throat> because this term is equal to zero. Both epsilon and z are independent and have zero expectations, so the second term is equal to zero. So the final block is sigma 2, 2, which is equal to the expected value of mu plus lambda z plus um, epsilon minus mu times right, is equal to, and I won't do this, but this simplifies to lambda lambda transpose plus psi. Okay? So, Putting all this together, this tells us that the joint distribution of this vector zx is going to be Gaussian with mean vector given by 
that, which we worked out previously. So this is, this is the mu zx that we worked out previously. <coughs> and covariance matrix given by that. So, in principle, um, let's see. So the parameters of our model are mu, lambda, and psi. And so, in order to find the parameters of this model, um, you know, we're given a training set of m examples. Um, and so we like to do a mass molecular estimation of the parameters. And so in principle, one thing you could do is you can actually write down you know, what P of xi is. And, right, so P of xi, <coughs> um, xi is actually, excuse me, the distribution of x, right? If, if, again, you can marginalize this Gaussian. And so the distribution of x, which is the, you know, the lower half of this partition vector, is going to have mean mu and covariance given by lambda lambda transpose plus psi, right? So that's the distribution that we're, that, that we're, that we're using to model P of x. Um, and so in principle, one thing you could do is actually write down you know, the, log like, the log likelihood of your parameters, right? Which is just, you know, the product of, of I guess, the sum over i log P of xi, <coughs> where P of xi will be given by this Gaussian density. Right? And um, I'm using theta as a shorthand to denote all of my parameters. And so I mean, you actually know what the density for Gaussian is. And so uh, you can you know, say P of xi is this Gaussian with mean mu and covariance given by this, lambda lambda transpose plus psi. So you can actually write down the log likelihood of your parameters as follows. And you can try to take derivatives of your log likelihood <coughs> with respect to your parameters and maximize the log likelihood. Right. It turns out that if you do that, you end up with sort of an, an, an intractable optimization problem, or at least one that you, oh, excuse me, you end up with an <coughs> optimization problem that you will not be able to find an, an analytic sort of closed form solution to. So if you say, my model for x is this, and we'll try to do maximum likelihood parameter estimation, you won't be able to find the maximum likelihood estimate of the parameters in closed form. Um, so what I would have liked to do is, well, so. <coughs> so um, in order to fit parameters to this model, what we'll actually do is use the EM algorithm in which um, in the E step, right, we'll compute that. Um, and this formula looks the same, except that one difference is that now z is a continuous random variable. And so in the E step, we we'll actually have to find the density qi of zi, where it's a, sort of the E step actually requires that we find you know, the, the posterior distribution, the, the, sort of a density to the random variable zi. And then the m step um, will then perform the following maximization, where uh, again, because z is now continuous, um, <coughs> we now need to integrate over z Okay, we're in the M step now because zi is continuous. We now have an integral over z rather than a sum. Okay, so hoping to go a little bit further in deriving these things, but I don't have time today. Um, so we'll wrap that up next, next in, in in the next lecture. But before I close, let's check if there are questions about about the whole factor analysis model thing. So um, <clears throat> when we come back in the next lecture, 
I will wrap up this model and particularly I want to go a little bit deeper into the E and M steps since there are some tricky parts for the factor analysis model specifically. Okay, I'll see you, see you in a couple of days.